Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my brothers and sisters. Um, welcome to an intimate dinner. Oh, not dinner, breakfast. Dinner. breakfast. I like that. I, I, did, I thought you said you don't want any more food. Uh, he said he didn't eat any up. Breakfast, alhamdulillah, Turkish style. Um, to our masjid, Southgate Masjid. This is the first mosque in Southgate. We are very grateful that Imam Siraj was able to join us all the way from America. It's good to see him. And thank you for coming, brothers and sisters. Um, this is going to be a small conversation between us all about how Imam Siraj set up his own masjid in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Imam Siraj, thank you for coming. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here and good to see you again. Jazakallah khair. Last time uh, we had an adventure, didn't we, together? Remember? No. Your Concorde, your Concorde flight? Yeah. <laughs> that was the last time? I'm just joking. No. <laughs> I'm not talking to you. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Imam Siraj basically missed his flight. And he was in New York. And he said to me, um, Brother Masrur, I've missed my flight. I said, you stay there. I'm going to sort you out. He said, what would you mean? I've missed my flight. I had my cousin in New York at that time. I called him up and I said to him, where are you? He goes, I'm still taxiing. I said, go to the JFK airport and buy a one-way ticket for Imam Siraj on Concord. He paid 1,800 pounds for it. And Alhamdulillah, Imam Siraj was with us, what, four hours after that? Yeah, right. Well before the, the talk, which right. we thought we couldn't do. Allah bless him, Alhamdulillah. He, you're probably the only Imam, only Muslim activist who has been on a Concord. Probably. Alhamdulillah. So tell us about you. How did you start this masjid? Yeah, I, I want to um, start with... Um, you know, really my beginning before the masjid, um, I was in an organization called the Nation of Islam. You've heard about it, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali. And um, by the way, I remember I was invited by the Muslims in Scotland years ago, right? And they, they, they brought me from the airport. And as we were driving, I'm seeing these big posters advertising my program, right? Says, Imam Siraj Wahaz, the best friend of Malcolm X. And I started laughing. I was laughing so hard, I was on the floor laughing. And they said, why are you laughing? And I said, I didn't know, I didn't know Malcolm. You know, I was 14 years old when he was assassinated. But Malcolm was my hero. And if you understand the, the black movement in the United States, Malcolm X is like the man. When I was a young man, I would go around the house quoting Malcolm X. Back during slavery, there were two kinds of slaves. There was the field Negro and the house Negro. So Malcolm was my, my man. The person that I did know is Muhammad Ali. Wow. And um, by the way, Muhammad Ali was very funny, very funny guy, right? He was on a, he was on a plane one day, and the um, flight attendant said, Mr. Muhammad Ali, please put on your seatbelt. He said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. <laughs> she said, Superman don't need no plane. <laughs> <laughs> so, so really, the, but, but really, Imam Muhammad Ali, we used to hang out together, right? Sometimes we'd go, he was very loved and respected by the people. We went to United Nations, I went with him, and literally police cars stopped to get his autograph. He was a man that was very much loved and respected. So I was in this group called the Nation of Islam, and we weren't Muslims, we were called Muslims, Nation of Islam. Um, you know, Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam in 1964. And he became Sunni Muslim. He made pilgrimage uh, that same year. He died uh, one year later. Um, so I was in that group. Uh, we didn't fast in Ramadan. We fasted in December. We didn't make Salat. So, so what we call Muslim, but we were not Muslim then. Malcolm understood that. If you read the, I recommend you read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Everybody should read it. And if you read it, you'll find out he made Hajj when he left the Nation of Islam, he made pilgrimage to Mecca. And, and I want you to pay attention to the chapter where he talks about him making Salat. He said, I'm embarrassed. I was in a, a minister in the Nation of Islam for 12 years, and I didn't know how to make Salat. He said he mimicked the people around him, and he did what they did. Wow. So 1975, let me tell you how Allah would have it. The leader of the Nation of Islam named Elijah Muhammad. You may, must have heard of the name Elijah Muhammad. When he died was significant. He died one day before our national holiday called Savior's Day. Right. And why was that significant? Because all of the major people in the Nation of Islam came to Chicago for that program. Mm -hmm. And why was that significant? Because at that moment, we cho chose a new leader. Elijah Muhammad just died. Who did we choose? His son, Minister Wallace Muhammad. 
Minister Wallace Muhammad was a minister in Philadelphia, and his, and his father would kick him out of the nation because he didn't believe in the theology right. of his father. Mm -hmm. So 1975, now Imam Wallace D. Muhammad, that's, that's his name, it was Wallace Muhammad, Wallace D. Muhammad, actually established Islam. He said, my father's not a prophet, because they taught, taught Elijah, said Elijah Muhammad's a messenger of Allah. He said, not a messenger. And then he began to teach us uh, Salat and things like that. So I credit him with um, leading us to Islam. We started a masjid in, in Brooklyn about, about 42 years ago. And it was 25 of us, all of us African Americans. So we started a masjid at Taqwa. Now, Juma prayer is about 1,300 people. Wow. The, the percentage of the African Americans in my masjid may be 20%. We have 39 different nationalities in our masjid. And that's how we started. Worked in that neighborhood, the people in the neighborhood know us. Uh, Allah blessed us, we closed down 20, uh, uh, no, 15 crack houses. Wow. I don't know, you know, you know what crack is? Yeah, yeah. You know what crack is? Well, we live in the real world, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that area became, you know, really uh, clean. In fact, um, I never forget, after we closed down these drug houses, every major newspaper in the world came and covered it. But this is what I was going to ask. How did you do that? I mean, if I went and told a drug dealer here, he'd probably shoot me. How did you clean they up would the area? Shoot you. Yeah. How did you do that in this, in this uh, area? Yeah, let me tell you how we did it. Um, uh, we had a partnership with the police, and we know where all the drug houses were. Right. We said, if you close them down, we will keep them closed. We had a 40-day anti-drug patrol. Literally, we stood in front of the houses, of, the, of those drug houses. And people came, and we said, the first of all, they raided it and got all the people out. Right. And, um, and when people come to buy drugs, we said, I'm sorry, um, you know, no more drugs are sold here. 24 hours a day. And these are Muslims? These are the Muslims. These are the Muslims. Closed it down, and they never opened up again. Uh, and the people in the neighborhood, they, they thanked us. Uh, one, one business owner said, um, um, when are you going to do that again, and how much will it cost? Uh. We said, no, no, we don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't do that. So I'm going to tell you about one woman, a Jehovah Witness, a black woman, an elderly woman. She came to my masjid. She said, I've never been in a place like this. And she sat down next to me. And she started talking, and she was so, so happy. And then she spoke so long, I said, Listen, I, gotta, I gotta go, right? But she said, I used to not like Muslims, now I love Muslims. I love her. And so we have buses that pass our masjid, right? And everybody in the city was talking about it. So whenever the bus came by, you could see the people coming on the side, pointing to them, there they are, there they are, there they are. So we became very, very, very famous. Um, and loved by people. Loved by people. Not despised by people. And well, let me tell you one thing. One day, um, after we closed the drug houses, I saw one of the drug dealers right. sitting across the street like this, with his head down. And I said, what's the matter? He said, you closed us down. I gave him shahada. Allahu Akbar. Yeah. He became Muslim? Became Muslim. Allahu Akbar. Yeah. So um, one thing we got, we got respect. Because the Muslim, they knew, people knew that the Muslims weren't scared. Right. So at one time, the patrols got real small. Mm -hmm. It was a Saturday morning, I never forgot. I went to a masjid um, for Fajr prayer. And after the uh, prayer, I asked the Imam, can I address the brothers? He said, yes. I said, you know, we have this anti-drug uh, you know, patrol, and we'd like for you to come. Come visit us. About 30 carloads of brothers mm -hmm. from that masjid came just for them, and most of them are immigrant Muslims, right? right. And they came to, like, to experience it, to say, wow, to see that. And, and I'm saying this to say that we can make a difference. We can make a difference. I think that we don't appreciate how powerful we are in terms of our faith. And um, if you want to do this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will help you. Think about, someone asked the question, how many battles did the Prophet participated. Answer 19. So it's not always, you know, easy. 
It's not always just praying. It's not always, always just fasting. It's not only just making dikura, but it's, it's a fight against the evils of society. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, Albert Einstein said the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch and do nothing about it. In the great power that Allah has given to us, we have a lot of power, we have moral power, and we have, we have a lot of strength if people, if people understand that and people, people have an appreciation of that. I've got one last question before I open it up to the floor. So did, did you see visibly any changes in the society in terms of reduction in crime, in terms of people coming more to the messages? In our neighborhood, yes. But not in, not in the country. Some areas are really um, bad. I think that we gave a good reputation for the Muslims. I'm, I know I went to California and the Muslims in California say, yeah, we closed, down, we closed down those crack houses. So all the Muslims were taking credit for that and they should, right? But, and I think a, a number of masjids did something similar to that. And they, there was a presence in their, in their neighborhoods. And in the, in the UK, we need, we need to get inspired in the same way. I want, I'm acutely aware that there are so many faces in front of us and I want to get them to ask questions if they have any. Absolutely. Anybody wants to ask anything to Imam Siraj to do with this particular journey that he has? My brother there. Um, um, obviously, New York 9-11, Let me just repeat the question just so that people can hear if you're listening to our broadcast from anywhere in the world. Um, the brother is saying 9-11 in New York. Imam, you must, be, you must have been in the middle of it all. Please give us your experience. We were. You know, we heard about it. I was in my masjid, in fact. We heard about it. And um, people started saying, um, you know, we thought there was a plane crash and we, until, when we learned out what was happening. And um, when people started saying it was the Muslims, I said Muslims couldn't do that. You know, that organized, you know, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know, I know what you're saying. You're right. Bad, 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 right? But I just, you know, and then they say from Saudi Arabia. I said, but that's not the point, but it, it, it changed a lot and put, put Muslims on the defensive, really a lot. And, um, and a lot changed in America in terms of how people looked at Muslims. I think we were getting very popular because I think what happened, the nation of Islam was very popular among black people. Big respect among black people. And, um, and then when that happened, it was like a step back for all Muslims everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we had to pay the price for something that somebody else did. You know, but um, alhamdulillah, it's getting back to normal now. In 1991, you know that the Congress of the United States of America never opens a session except an invocation by a Jewish rabbi or Christian minister, always. The first time in the history of America, a Muslim opened a session of Congress in 1991. Anybody know who that was? You. Me. Hey, Imam Siraj. And how was I dressed? Exactly the way I'm dressed now. Why? Because I wanted the Muslims to be proud of who we are. They know me, this is how I dress. Why am I going to put a different dress on? And so that was very major for this country. I had dinner with the um, Secretary of State, uh, Albright. I was invited by President, uh, who was that guy? One of the presidents for his, for his breakfast, I think it was Clinton. So the Muslims now begin to have this, these uh, profiles. You got Muslims down in Congress, you have you know, Muslims all over the place, in government, etc. SubhanAllah. So things change dramatically, but it's getting better, improved. Definitely getting better, there's no question about it. You know, we have 1,300,000 Muslims in New York City, 30 full-time Muslim schools, thousands of Muslim businesses. By the way, I have one complaint mm -hmm. about, about Muslims, right? Uh, there's a store that I go to, I get my newspapers owned by the Muslims. The workers are Muslims, the, the owners are Muslims. And one day I saw a sign that I never saw before. It said, no alcohol sold here. Whoa. I said, Allahu Akbar. And I looked a little closer. No alcohol sold here on Sundays. <laughs> Before 2 p.m. <laughs> and this is my complaint, right? Um, we're Muslims. I ain't selling drugs. I'm not selling new, uh, uh, cigarettes. 
alcohol, and we have thousands of Muslim businesses, most of them, almost all of them, sell all of those things that is prohibited, including pork. So if I have one complaint about Muslims, I will say that. If you're gonna have a Muslim business, be an example, and don't sell those things, those things that are haram, that's not permissible for us, not only to, to take, but even to sell. Allah protect us. Any other questions from anybody? Brother there, go ahead. I just wanted to get a picture of the nature of your mosque in the sense that what sort of activities you organized, how did you manage to make a cohesive spirit uh, in running the mosque, those sorts of things. The, the, the masjid... Um, Can I repeat the question? Please, go ahead. How, uh, he, brother wants to know uh, the picture of the mosque in the sense that how did you get to organize the mosque, how do you run it, how do you create a cohesive a basis for running the mosque. We do what other masters do. In other words, we have, we have all the prayers. There will be no salat with less than 200 brothers. Wow. Right? Sometimes 400, 500 brothers just for a salat. Um, during Ramadan, it's crazy, especially the last 10 nights. You, I mean, it's really packed. We have iftar and we have suhoor in, in, in the masjid. We have had classes. But our masjid is not big enough to have formal classes. So we have classes whenever, wherever we can, we can, we can, we can fit them. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, having 39 different um, uh, nationalities, you know, is wonderful, right? So like in, in the masjid, basically I know where everybody is, right? Because I'm, I'm here, Brother Uthman from Sudan is over here, uh, Brother Mohammed Barry, he's a Mu'eddin, he's over here, he's from Guinea. And then Kamal is over there, he's from Bangladesh, right? And we have two brothers, Abdullah, right? Both of them from Mauritania. One is dark and one is light, right? So it's like everywhere you know, and alhamdulillah, it is a, it's a tremendous pleasure. We have, a, we have a security, one of the best securities in the city. Our brothers are always, you know, protecting the masjid. Uh, um, and then you have, um, um, we first came in that masjid, we built that masjid, there was not one Muslim business. Now over 35 Muslim businesses on the block alone. Wow. And in the neighborhood, because why? Wow, when we started, when we started you know, building the community, um, other Muslims came and opened businesses and, 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 and stuff like that. Uh, we plan now to tear down the masjid and rebuild it. A nice size masjid. Oh, this is the new plan? The new plan, yeah. We, we're, gonna, we're gonna advertise it soon, we're gonna come to you. Uh, you, you, you're the granddaddy of fundraising. Stop it! Not me. Stop it! Stop it! <laughs> um, so then we're going to have, we're gonna have we classes, even we're going to have residential, inshallah, inshallah. Um, that will pay for, pay for the expenses of the master. Can we come over, all of us? 100%. 100%, yeah. And you can also pay, too. <laughs> I'm sure so we'll you get more about that, you know, and, uh, you know, as we do formally, as we... Um, launch our program, inshallah. I can witness to the uh, prayer. I went there for Dhuhr prayer. I didn't find any space. It was a weekday. And I think it was Christmas period. Whoa. I had to pray outside. I was looking for him. He was very busy. I went for Asr prayer. It was packed. I went for Maghrib prayer. It was packed. At Isha, I nailed him down and I had a chat to him. <laughs> Subhanallah, I said to myself, a mosque that is so packed for five daily prayers, there must be something about their relationship that they have with one another. Not the extraordinary service, but the relationship. Right. And I, and I felt the brotherhood. Yeah. I felt the strength of your it feelings. Is. There, it is. Alhamdulillah. Any other questions from anybody else? Sisters, you can ask any question too, of course. It's all open. Um, anyone else? A sister in the front. I'd like to ask about youth and how you encourage teenagers, especially maybe around the age of like 16, 17. We haven't generally gone to the mosque very much, but we would like to now bring them back in. Is there a way or technical tools that we could use to bring them back? Just to repeat, how do Imam Siraj in his masjid attract the youth? And I tell you, his mosque is full of them. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah, we, we can do better. You know, um, when, when we started, of course, you know, I filled up the master myself. I have nine children. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> and I can say this, all of my nine children, every one of them went to a full-time Muslim school. I think that Islamic education is, is, is critical. 
We made a decision that since there were 30 Muslim schools, we wouldn't open up another school, but we would rather go to those, those different schools. So we had, we had families who had a lot of children, we had a lot of activities. If you see now, we have a youth director. Every masjid should have a youth director. We have so many activities in our masjid because of our youth director. So we attract the youth and, you know, um, sometimes we lose them. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, Allah blessed me with nine children, six of them practice. Three don't say they're not Muslim, but they're not practicing as they should. So um, one, one imam told me he had a lot of children. He said, Imam, I'll be happy if one of them be Muslim. Allah. It is very, very, very challenging. The difficulty that the youth have today, we didn't have the difficulty, nor during the, the time of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. The average uh, American child watches 40 thousand television commercials a year. That's just the commercials. What about the programs? What about Instagram? What about the, 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 um, all of these devices that we have? And it is a big, big challenge. And I don't want you to think, yo, man, we got it made. Our master got it made. No, it's not like that. We, we struggle too. The same way you struggle, the same way we struggle. Um, and so, but this time we plan to open up a school. While we depended on others before, we planned to open up a school. We had all kinds of programs. We had um, a basketball for some of the youngsters. Um, so we try to do as many programs as we can. It's work, it's a lot of work. And, and I'm not saying we got the answers, you'll come to me and I will tell you how to do it. Not at all. You know, we have to all work together. And especially, and, I, and again, the biggest thing to me is, is, is the youth and keeping them in the deep. You, you used to play basketball. Love playing play. basketball. You Can do. you play basketball? No. Anybody here would like to play? <laughs> there you go. You want to play? Let me ask you a question. If you play the shake, who's going to win? When? You or me? <laughs> you? Astaghfirullah, <laughs> Imam. You know something? Let me tell you something. When, when I was, when, Imam, let me tell you something. Right? When I was born, um, my uncle saw me the day I was born, right? And he said, he looked at me and said, this is what my mother told me, he's going to be a preacher. Oh. He's going to be a preacher, right? So when I was in church, I taught Sunday school. When I was in the Nation of Islam, I became a minister. When I became Sunni Muslim, I became an imam. Wow. Now, I knew that, but I found out recently, my mother told me, my aunt said the same thing when I was born. Mm. You're going to be a preacher. Now, I remember I was... Uh, seven years old, Sunday morning, getting ready to go to church, right? And, um, and, and I want you to look at my body language. I said to my mother, why we got to go to church anyway? My mother took out a belt. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Now you understand why you got to go to church? Yes, ma'am. But something interesting. About six months ago, my mother, 89 years old, took shahada. Allahu Akbar. From me. Allahu Akbar. Now you understand why you got to go to masjid? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> so you got, you got to lead from the front, basically, yeah. with the youth. So my thing is, is that I always loved sports. Basketball, football, baseball. But basketball, I played my junior high school, high school, and college, right? And, you know, when we grew up, we said, man, if I can play in the NBA, National Basketball Association, make millions of dollars, you know, wallahi, what I do, I would do this a hundred times more than want to play basketball in the NBA. Don't get much money, but you know what? The love, meeting people, meeting people around the world, meeting people around the country, um, it is a great, I can't think of anything I'd rather do than what I'm doing now. Allah bless you. Um, I don't play basketball, but I play badminton. I don't know whether you know what badminton is. I know what it is. He's laughing, right? <laughs> is it that bad? Yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we would, if we played it, we wouldn't even admit it. No. <laughs> but we've got loads of people here who play football. So I'm sure that's... Okay. No way. You, you mean soccer or football? Football. Not, not your football, our football. Oh, okay. <laughs> with, with, our, with our legs. Um, um, brother, go ahead, Abdul Latif. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, uh, now, obviously... This could be taken as quite controversial in terms of Palestine. Now, Palestine, is very, as Muslims, is very close to all of our hearts. Yes. Um, what would you suggest is, is, is a balance? Obviously, you have a masjid and um, you fit within a greater framework of a non-Muslim country. How would you recommend or suggest 
people will tackle this, the, the issue of Palestine or, or, or take action or boycott or lobby within a, within a mosque community? Uh, just, just so that you understand, it's not just Palestine, I think. It's, it's about the greater struggles that we may have whether it is to do with the Muslims' right in China, whether it is to do with the Muslims in other parts of the world, Kashmir, yeah. or anything. So, global struggle that we see, how do Muslims do that while they're also locally active? Sorry, yeah. The reason why I used Palestine it's a good example. Example was, was also because of America, because of the Jewish lobby for Palestine. And I, wondered how I think, we should, I think we, should, we should fight, we should struggle. Um, let me tell you what I think I consider a model. South Africa. Now, it was, I don't know if you studied the history of South Africa, the brutal apartheid. Mm. And what most people don't know, and I bring, I bring this to their attention, the um, participation of the Muslims. The Muslims are 2% of the population of South Africa, yet they played a pivotal role in fighting against injustice. Everybody talk about Nelson Mandela, Della, and we should. He was in prison 29 years. There were Muslims in prison with him for 29 years. There's one person you may know, you should invite him here. He was the ambassador to the United States from South Africa, Ibrahim Rasul. Yeah. Okay, B beautiful. He was here two weeks ago. Okay, that's my guy. He's, he's his friend. Okay, that's one of my guys. I'm gonna let you know that, right? So w one of the things that um, you notice, when Nelson Mandela became president, you know who was the chief, the, uh, chief uh, uh, justice? was a Muslim, mm -hmm. Muhammad, Ismail Muhammad, Minister of Justice, another Muslim, uh, 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 I, forget, I, forget, I forget his name. Um, so you had like 17 members in the parliament, Muslims. So the Muslims played a pivotal role in fighting against injustice. We should do the same thing. Now, you gotta be smart. You gotta be smart how you do it because people will label you as something, as some enemy. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't speak the truth. You, you, you should be speak the truth. But as you, you said, we should fight against all injustice. Muslims against injustice, you know, and even when, when Muslims are being unjust to Muslims. So we should talk about it, not be afraid, you know, organize, struggle, look at the people struggling, you know, uh, even non-Muslims and, you know, and work, work together. But I think we should, we should lift our voices and not, not say anything. We have to say something. We come to this young lady over there. Salam. Um, I want to ask, how does your mosque engage with collaborating with other mosques and organizations to sort of maximize your efforts? Can you take it from the London and UK context? Every... Issues and challenges in collaborating and that you have... Let me repeat this question. The sister is asking, how do you collaborate with other mosques locally and nationally? Yalaba. Every issue that there were uh, with Muslims in America, we were involved with it. Al Masjid was involved with it. I, re I remember, remember Bos Bosnia years ago? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we attended the rallies. In fact, I attended a rally near the um, U United Nations, and there was a young sister from Bosnia, about 12 years old, gave the most eloquent speech. Wow. All the speeches that were given, I remember her speech. You know what she said? Please help my people. Every issue, Pal Palestine, uh, any issue, we were there. And uh, I made sure that our masjid would be there and our masjid would be involved. The, the, Muslim, the Rohingya Muslims and the Ugla Muslims, everywhere, we should be, in, be, be, be involved. And I don't think we should do something, you know, just for our masjid, our people. No, I'm, like I mentioned, I'm black, alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm proud, but there are issues all over the country and all over the world that we should get involved with. And I recommend that every masjid do that, work with other masjids. And we're good for that, alhamdulillah. Masjid of Taqwa was known. Um, any masjid that had any difficulty, we were there with them, inshallah. We also have a good culture in North London. We are trying to collaborate. For example, we've got somebody from Palmer's Green Masjid. We've got a brother from Enfield Masjid. Alhamdulillah, we invited everybody to come. Just to, um, uh, I suppose, move our discussion towards the last part. Brother Ishraq, you had your hand. So we talked about global struggles with Muslims just now. Can we get it more localised? So in London, we're currently facing a cost of living crisis and within the Muslim community also. So um, where we're facing food poverty, food insecurity, which two questions. Is that a similar case in New York as well? Are Muslims and non-Muslims facing food insecurity? And two, how do Muslims get involved in 
what are our responsibilities um, to do to tackle food poverty and food insecurity? So the brother is talking about food insecurity and food poverty. In London, with cost of living, the food poverty is rising exponentially. People are making choices between keeping their heating on or feeding their family. Muslim families are also facing the same. Do you face the same in, in New York? And if you do, how do you tackle it? We are trying to do something here. For example, we've got a food bank. Yeah. Uh, what do you do? We have the same thing. We have an organization called Muslims Giving Back. And there's a, a million of them. We do that all the time. We give away free, uh, free food and things like that. Um, and um, so similar to what you're doing, any way that we can help, you know, and, and by the way, not just Muslims. Sometimes long lines of people come to our masjid, Muslims and non-Muslims, you know, we're feeding them. Um, and I want to say this, you know, I was in, you heard about Los Angeles, mm -hmm. right? And it's a sh shame. People, thousands of people are living in the streets in Los Angeles, literally, because they can't afford to pay rent. And I want to do something about it. I was touched by it when I went to the West Coast last week, and I said, you know what, this is ridiculous. And now I, I, I knew about Los Angeles, but I was also in San Francisco, same thing. And um, Santa Clara, same thing. And, um, and the one thing about us, Muslims, we care. I'm not saying other people don't care, but that's part of what we do. That I mentioned last night, somebody in Hellfire because they didn't feed the poor. That's, a resp that's our responsibility. So I'm saying that we got to do better. Most of you probably have more um, wealth than we have in our master, but we do, I have to say, we do a lot. We, we share with whatever we have. Um, and I think that um, that's one of my greatest pleasure, helping people. And so we got we to gotta do better. And thank you for asking the question. Uh, you'll be very pleased to know, even before we started five daily prayers in this masjid, even before we secured all the site, we started our food bank program. Excellent. And we now have more, almost uh, 70, 80, maybe even 100 families who are coming and taking food every week. Excellent. Um, and Mostly that. Muslims? No, oh, everything. Every, every. Muslim, non-Muslims. Anybody is welcome. And we have a very good system where Brother Ishaq actually, he's part of the coordination team and he's leading it with his team, they're doing a fantastic job. Our future vision is to create a hub for the Muslim community, as well as non-Muslim communities, who can benefit from the services that we provide. A small service is prayers, is five daily prayers. It's right. like bread and butter, right. of course. But on top of that, we want to provide all of these things that you've talked about so that the communities can come together. Imam, a lot of people have asked me privately, but I couldn't answer, how did you become Muslim? I didn't know, so I said, I have no idea, I'm gonna ask you. I think with me is probably a little bit different because I, I joined the Nation of Islam first. first. But how did you become uh, join them? Because, let me tell you this, can I be honest? Yes. A student at New York University, no Muslim, not one, ever came to me and offered me anything about Islam, not one. Oh. But the brothers from the Nation of Islam did. So I'm sitting down in the lobby Brother from the Nation of Islam come, how you doing my black brother? And that did it. Wow. You know, and, and you got to understand, appreciate the struggle of, of African Americans in America to appreciate the Nation of Islam, to attract people like Muhammad Ali and, and Malcolm X and, and Imam Siraj and others like that. And part of Allah's mercy is that he guided us to Islam through that Nation of Islam. Um, Hundreds of thousands. I don't even know the number, but hundreds of thousands. So um, that's what attracted me. Um, I, I, you know, I played basketball. The captain of the basketball team was Jerry Tenex from the Nation of Islam. So we would, we would sit together, you know, going to the games, and he would talk to me. And I remember uh, Wednesday night, the first day I went to, to the temple, I know the exact suit I wore, the shoes that I wore, right? And um, I had a big afro. You know what the afro is, right? Yeah. My afro I can't imagine you with one. Though. Well, yeah, okay. My afro was so big, you can land, land a plane on it. <laughs> That's how big it was, right? <laughs> so, um, so that began it. And let me tell you something about, a few things about the Nation of Islam. Um, I quit my job to sell a 25 cent newspaper called Muhammad Speaks Newspapers. Whoa. I myself, went and knocked on thousands of doors, projects, by myself. And I want you to imagine a 25-cent newspaper and all the change in my pocket. 
And I, I went by myself and knocking on doors. I need, I need two brothers, two volunteers. I'm going to show you something. Two brothers come forward. Two brothers come straight forward. It's okay. You? You stay here. I need another brother. There you go, another brother. Now, you brothers study martial arts? Nope. nope. You study martial arts? Right. Do you know how to fall? Sure. Sure. You know how to fall? <laughs> okay, so this is this real story, right? I'm selling the newspapers one day on Eastern Parkway, and I'm about to go in the building, and I see two young men in the hallway. And I said, they're going to try to rob me. My question to you all, should I go in the building? What'd you say? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Come go? So let me tell you, I went, right? <clears throat> so the guy on the right, switch, switch. The guy on the right looked real mean. <laughs> <laughs> you look real mean. This guy was more reasonable, right? <laughs> so what I did, I put you in the right? I took out a uh, Muhammad Sleep's newspaper and I did like this. Boom! Boom! I said, now, give me 25 cents. I said, just like that. <laughs> Law my witness. This guy on the right took out a gun. <laughs> He took a gun. He took out a gun. It wasn't that big. He said, you just can't rob a Muslim. <laughs> Put his gun back in his pocket and gave him 25 cents. My point that I'm telling you is he did good. Thank you. <laughs> the point that I'm saying is that the nation of Islam, say what you want to say about them, but they weren't scared. And I went all throughout the neighborhoods. So my point is this, right? One day, See, we call it da'wah, they call it fishing. Mm. We're going to go fishing. We're going to go fishing for our people. See, that's part of the motivation. I, that's the, the, my people. So one day I told one of the officials in the, in the, mass, in the, in the temple, at that time we called him temple, I said, can you get me a bus? He said, well, yeah, a bus? I said, yeah, give me a bus, give me a school bus. They did it. And I said, I want to drive around the neighborhood. And I said, I saw a park there. I said, come on, let's go over there. I saw a group of people. I got off the bus and said, Islam is for you, black man. Get in the bus. 13 of them got in the bus. Whoa. Took them to the temple. So I'm saying the boldness that we had, we didn't have real Islam, but we had the spirit. Right? If we only knew how now to direct it with the right to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we had, so the nation of Islam, was, was, was perfect for Allah to use to bring us into, into Islam through Imam Walafuddin Muhammad. And I thank Allah for him because that was the man that was responsible uh, for guiding us to Islam. I know you make dua for him all the time. I do. And any further questions from anybody else? I'm just One more. Of, one more. Let's take one more question. One more. Last question. Last question. Obviously, you have a history of the Muslim community for many, many years. So now, unfortunately, as a Muslim community, we're very reactive to problems in the US. So what do you anticipate, given obviously in our country we see many instances where a son or a daughter will tell their parents, or perhaps the family, mom, dad, I believe in Allah, I approach you, I fast and pray because you tell me to do. But when they come of age, they say, but I don't believe in this religion, I'm leaving. So this is one of the unfortunate trends we're seeing where children or families growing up are leaving the deen. And one of the worst statistics I've been told by the mom said, in America, probably 23% of Muslim children who grow up in Muslim household, by the time they evolve of age, they leave the deen. So, unfortunately, the trend we see is very big in the Muslim community. Are we taking it for granted? And why are we not investing enough? Recognize the problem that's a to face, and how can we kind of change the, this, this trend as we can see in our communities? Just to repeat the question, brother is talking about Muslims who are leaving Islam. There is a growing number of young people who leave Islam when they grow up and become an adult. What can we do? What should we do now to safeguard those who are leaving and those who are there? Imam, I know you touched upon it earlier, but maybe you want to uh, this, say a bit more. There's a sister, right? Um, she was born in, in New Mexico, and she migrated to the United States. She was like seven years old, and she was a Catholic, and she converted to Islam. Mm -hmm. And so she goes around. She's a da'i, da'iya. 
and she goes around giving lectures. She's, she, has, she, she works with um, converts and re reverts, right? Uh, I attended a, a conference where she spoke, and she said something that startled me, that really affected me. She says, um, there's a study that 70% of the converts leave Islam. So I had two questions. How do you know that? How do you know 70%? Is it accurate, number one? Number two, how many Muslims who are not converts leave the fold of Islam? I can tell you for a fact, a lot do. We know every masjid, people used to practice because every once in a while someone come back and we, like we have a party, alhamdulillah, they came back to Islam. I wish I had the answer, I do. I talked about it all the time. I talk, I, this is my major concern. When I go all over the world, I talk about Muslims holding on to the deen. And we have a, we have a big challenge. Shaitan is, he's very active. Um, uh, I'm gonna give you an example. One of the brothers told me, I, I, I gave a Juma khutbah in Atlanta, Georgia recently, and came back with a Muslim who's a professor at a university. He told me, ma'am, the university, we're losing a lot of the Muslims, especially in the university. Harvard University is perhaps the most prestigious university in the world. Mm -hmm. And you know the difference between an, an imam, uh, a, a, a minister, and a rabbi, compared to a chaplain. A chaplain is over an institution. Schools, hospitals, army, they have chaplains. Hospitals, they have chaplains, right? An imam over a masjid, uh, uh, a rabbi over a synagogue, and a minister over a church. Harvard has more than 40 chaplains. I'm gonna tell you something that, brother, you're gonna say, Imam Sarad, you're making it up. The head chaplain of Harvard University is an atheist. What? How does that work? Atheist. Head chaplain, atheist. When we send our children to school, his name is Greg Epstein, you can look it up, Greg Epstein, right? When we send our children to school, did, and, and I gotta be careful the way I'm saying this because I know you're gonna look at me, some of you are gonna get mad at me. The decline of um, Muslims began with compulsory education. In my country, 87% of the people go to public school, 87%. 10% private school and 3% homeschooling. Those children who go to public school are in danger. This is why I spend all my money to send my children to a Muslim school, and that's not guaranteed. Why, what's the difference? Access. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, uh, teach your children salat at the age of seven. Read the hadith, where it's midnight, the Prophet, alayhi salat was salam, was detained, and they said, Ya Rasulullah, the women and the children are asleep in the masjid waiting for you to lead the salat. Access. So now you take someone that we have access to, we push them out to someone else who don't necessarily have their best interests. Because we teach them what a lot of messengers say to us, and they teach whatever they teach. That's number one. Number two, television. We didn't have television then. Internet, Twitter. You know that stuff. I don't even know that stuff. Like Instagram. Instagram. There Come on, go. man. Come on. Uh, Come on. TikTok. TikTok. Come on. Come on. Uh, Come on. Facebook. Facebook. Oh, Boom. One more. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You. So my point is how, how do you keep them attracted? And then they come down to these masjids. Some of them don't even let sisters in the masjid. Yeah. Are you crazy? Are you serious? You don't let sisters in the masjid? Are you you still do that? No. Oh. Look, our sisters are here. I'm sorry, I'm not you. Yeah, some people do. Yeah. Would you believe, Imam, I went to a masjid with my wife and my daughter, and there is a sign outside, no space for sisters, in London. Keep your and wife I, and your daughter in the car. And I fought with them. I made, them, they, I made sure they pray, and the fight was absolutely horrible. I tell you, these people... Yeah. Anyway, carry on. So, but, so what I'm saying to you, I wish I, wish I knew the answer. I, I, I have the basic principle, but how do, how do you do it, right? Because you have Muslim adults on these things that's, they're committing sins. Muslims, TV, and watching stuff that you shouldn't watch. 
You know, so I'm saying that that's our struggle, brother. I wish I, wish I can tell you this is the answer, except to try to keep them as close as we can. And okay. Inshallah. Oh, with these words, we'll finish, inshallah. Brothers, before you go anywhere, Imam Siraj, you, you have come all the way from America. I know you're here for a little while. You're going tomorrow, right? Yes. So, may Allah bless you for your just unbelievable uh, uh, energy that you have. You've been a, a hero for many of us, childhood and onwards. And I followed you thoroughly and enjoyed every minute of your uh, knowledge, your experience and your excitement, alhamdulillah. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't take much to really change. Um, a person's life and that's what uh, Imam Siraj's life is all about small uh, encounters people's lives have changed um, so that's uh, a word of from my heart but gratitude and thanks for coming mm -hmm. but I don't want to put a fundraiser on you but if you as individual people from business communities the leaders the members of different committees don't help us to raise the 3.1 million that's left we have a serious risk of getting into a bit of a wrangle that we don't want to. We have paid 3.5 million, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. So in Ramadan, we're going to be launching this program for this Ramadan only for one month. It's called a thousand by thousand. A thousand people donate a thousand each. Alhamdulillah. That's a million at the end of it, right? right? In one month. Right. And I'm looking for all of you here to take up that challenge. Minimum you would make a promise is to raise a thousand. Mm -hmm. Do I see a nod of yes? Yes. Can we see hands approval that we will all raise a thousand each? Go and put your hands up if you are going to, inshallah. Now this is your promise with Allah. You will raise a thousand or more and you will have to find more people who mm -hmm. do the same. It's like the snowball effect, we call it. You, you, ten people find ten more people. Right. They find ten more people. Before you know, you've got the 3.5 million that you need to do this. My brothers and sisters, money is not the problem. The problem is, it's like that Imam who said, I've got good news and bad news. Which one would you like to hear? The congregation said the good news. He said the good news is the money that you want for the masjid, we have it, alhamdulillah. They all said takbir Allahu Akbar. The Imam said the bad news is it's in your pockets. Can I have them please? <laughs> so it's in our pockets. And I know you have taken that pledge. May Allah bless you. We're going to take a break now. And if you're watching this program from anywhere in the world on our broadcast services, please, you can also join. All you need to do is email us, info at um, southgatemosque.co.uk. And inshallah, join in this thousand by thousand. A thousand people donating minimum of a thousand pounds or raising it in the month of Ramadan. Excellent. Thank you again. May Allah bless you. May Allah accept it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu alaikum. Amen. Make dua for us, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. I am so, so happy. Uh, we're building a masjid here, a school in Southgate. And it is a lovely place. Please help and donate anything you can. We need more than 3.5 million pounds. And alhamdulillah, we want you to be a part of it. I can't wait till it's built. Alhamdulillah.